When the three-year Sunday lectionary was introduced after Vatican II, with the Gospel of Matthew in cycle A, Mark in B, and Luke in C, the composers faced a problem with reading Mark throughout ordinary time. Mark is one third the length of the other gospels. There was simply not enough material to cover a whole year. The solution was to shorten the gospel readings and stretch them over a number of weeks. <clears throat> Last week, this week, and next week, we have readings from one chapter of Mark 6, where Jesus is rejected as a prophet by his own village, then sends his chosen disciples on a mission. And next week, recur, recounts both the murder of John the Baptist and the gathering in the people in a deserted place where Jesus feeds them with loaves and fishes. But then the lectionary leaves Mark on the last Sunday of July, the 25th, and for the next four Sundays until August 22nd, the readings are from the long bread of discourse, bread of life discourse from John six. Perhaps we are to think of the Mark and Jesus giving the Joanine discourse. Knowing though how the readings uh, on a particular Sunday fit into a given gospel and recalling the readings from a previous Lectio or week can enrich and deepen our time of prayer. Another aspect of the lectionary is that there is a thematic connection between the Old Testament and the reading of the gospel. Prior to Vatican II, there were no Old Testament readings at mass, which deprived Catholics of God's revelation to the people of Israel. I will now reflect on the connection between the first reading and the gospel. The first reading today from the prophet Amos around 700 years before Christ continues the theme of the rejected prophet, which we heard when Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his native place and among his own kin. The prophets of the Old Testament, and especially Amos, have much to say to our world today and much to pray over. The word prophet means one who speaks on behalf of another, primarily on behalf of God. It also means, though, one who speaks on behalf of those who have no one to speak for them. Amos among the great prophets, and also Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Hosea offer strident denunciations of the abuse of the voiceless poor by the rich. Amos thunders against the rich of the kingdom of Israel, and he says, God, who will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. These prophets also make a mockery of religion as, quote, <clears throat> they lay their garments down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink wine, which they bought with fines imposed on the poor. Amos is an inclusive disturber as he warns the preening women of Israel that disaster looms ahead. Hear this word, he says, you affluent women of Bashan who live on Mount Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring something to drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness the time is surely coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks. Here he's producing the destruction of the kingdom by the Assyrians. Amos, I doubt, would be a featured speaker at the graduation ceremony of a Jesuit university. 
The Amos we meet today's reading also attacks the court prophet, Amaziah, one of those who quote the voice of God to tell leaders what they want to hear. I think we have some court prophets at work in our world today. But Amos says, I was no prophet, nor have I belonged to a company of prophets. I was a shepherd, dresser of sycamore trees. But the Lord took me from following the flock and said to me, go speak to my people, Israel. Amos, like Jesus, or Jesus, like Amos, speaks the word of God. And Jesus, like Amos, was rejected. The gospel today follows immediately this story of Jesus' rejection as a prophet without honor. But now he commissions his 12 disciples to adopt the prophetic lifestyle of itinerant preachers, which he was. In the Gospel of Mark, there is a gradual formation of the disciples. They are the first called to follow Jesus. They are to become people who fish for humans, chapter one. Later, they are called to be with him, to spend their lives with him, and given power over evil. At this point, their mission closely parallels that of Jesus, preaching repentance, confronting the power of evil, healing the sick. Jesus will tell them later that they too must be rejected as he will be rejected. They are then in the instruction from today's gospel, they are to travel in pairs, reflecting or perhaps anticipating the missionary practice of the early church, where most often a man and a woman traveled together proclaiming God's word. For example, in the letters of Paul and in Acts, Prisca and Aquila. Paul says that, do not I have the right to travel as do Peter and the other apostles with a wife? Paul travels with Phoebe. Their lack of material support in today's gospels, lack of food, money, and sick, and, and sack or a briefcase, and their dependence on hospitality for others are signs of their total reliance on God and of their freedom. Unlike Amaziah, the disciples are not prophets for hire. Shaking the dust from one's feet was a symbolic act mentioned in today's gospel, but it was an act which Jews performed when leaving a pagan or unclean land. They thought that evil is contaminating and clings to a person like dust. The mission of the apostles today is a reenactment of what they have seen walking with Jesus. As I said, preaching repentance, driving out demons and curing the sick. Repentance, metanoia, is not sorrow or regret for sin, but rather a change of heart, a change of looking at, uh, a new way of looking at things, an exchange of a former way of living with a renewed way, the way of Jesus. The world of Jesus and his followers was populated by evil spirits. In Jewish thought, the heirs, they are thought to be the heirs of the fallen angels. When Jesus casts out demons and empowers his followers to do so, they are confronting and conquering the seen and unseen evils that control human life. But as we arrive at this point in the gospel, we have witnessed also the, the healing power and compassion of Jesus and the missionary disciples are to bring forth this power. Their lifestyle seems strange and even harsh today. 
and it was not even really normative always in the early church. Still, it has lasting value. The 12 who are sent out are to represent in their lives the actions of Jesus, even though Jesus is not with them. Our world today constantly needs metanoia, a new way of looking at things, to see people in other cultures. Pope Francis has called for fraternity. He calls it the frontier. The frontier on which we have to build is the challenge of the outstretched fraternity, the outstretched hand. Fraternity means respect. Just as Jesus touched the sick and the dying, followers of Jesus today are to bring the healing touch to human life. Pope Francis calls this beautifully a revolution of tenderness, repeating a phrase he has used often in his pontificate. And he says, what is tenderness? And answers, it is the true love that comes close and becomes real. It is a movement that starts from our heart and reaches the eyes, the ears, and the hands. When I see today the care and love shown by family, doctors, and nurses during the pandemic, it is clear that the revolution in tenderness is well underway. Followers of Jesus also continue then this compassionate healing ministry of Jesus. Followers of Jesus are also to liberate people from the multitude of seen, unseen, demonic forces that infect our lives. Again, in dramatic language, Pope Francis has written, money is the devil, devil's dung. An authentic co cooperative is that in which capital does not rule over man, not man ruling over money. This is when money works against the intensity of humankind. It is the devil's doing and everything suffer. Francis uses the dramatic language of demonic possession to describe the greed that is rampant in the modern world. In today's gospel, as I mentioned, the 12 are to represent in their lives the actions of Jesus even though Jesus is not with them. Out of love for Francis and in joy for his papacy, and I like the fact he's a Jesuit, I have used his words as an embodiment of the mission of disciples today. Today, people often ask where Jesus is amid despite disputes over authority in our church endless meetings and projects for renewal, and even escalating signs of wealth and prestige. And they wonder, does our church represent Jesus? Yet, people like Dorothy Day, Mother Teresa, or Cesar Chavez traveled light, as did the apostles in our gospel today, and they imaged the work of Jesus. Jesus and his disciples paid with their lives for their prophetic concern with the marginalized. And this witness continues among peoples too numerous to mention, but some give a face and a voice that inspire and encourage us today. I think of Jean Donovan and the Jesuits of El Salvador I think of Sister Dorothy Stang, a 74-year-old nun from Dayton who was murdered on February 12, 2005, while reading the Beatitudes to her murderers because she opposed the exploitation of the Brazilian rainforest by developers. Today, especially, I remember Father Stan, Stan Swami a 94-year-old Jesuit 
from Jamshedpur, India, a Jesuit province that was founded by missionaries from the Maryland province over 75 years ago. His life and mission was among the Dalits and other marginalized people in India. Though poor in health and suffering from Parkinson's disease, he was arrested on a trumped up charge of sedition by the present Indian government, imprisoned in abysmal circumstances, and he died on July 5th of this week. As I cycle through the faces and lives of the Zoom community today, I see also a cloud of witnesses who have been the voice and the hands of the compassionate Christ, who has also spoken out and lived lives against evil and greed and who bring joy and consolation to our world. The readings today give us much to pray about in gratitude and hope. Thank you and thank God.